Ever since we announced Diablo 4 at last BlizzCon 2019, uh, we've been sharing updates with you guys uh, through our blog, whether it's uh, items, skills, zones, even user interface updates. And uh, you guys seem to have really enjoyed that. Today, to mark the, the special occasion of BlizzCon Line on Blizzard's 30th anniversary, rather than doing a blog, we're, we're actually going to share lots of video, uh, introduce a new class like we saw in opening ceremonies, um, and also cover some op open world topics, including uh, mounts, camps, and PvP. Yeah, this is like the ultimate blog post, right? We, we get to actually hand deliver it. This is the dream. It, it's all come, it's all finally out there and we can talk about all of it. Just in case some of you guys missed it, your opening ceremony, let's take another look at the Rogue Announce video. I was a thief who stole from those more fortunate. I strayed from your light and found my trade in the shadows. They call it murder. I say, job well done. Those monsters with a scourge upon my flock. And you... Oh, you were the answer to their prayers. Then we are settled. And you owe me. The name you seek is... Thank the heavens for you. Heavens, I assure you, Father, the heavens didn't send me. Wow, I, I love that ending. I <laughs> oh, there's two things. There's the there's the rain of arrows off the mount for the win, and then 
when that guy takes the ear and he stretches it onto that 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 hook right at the end it's like oh <laughs> that ear box never gets old you know you i always wonder where all those ears from diablo 2 when you uh kill other players went now you know there's some creepy guy in a church collecting ears and putting them in a box just what we always thought no spoilers, but uh, we're going to be hearing a, a little bit more about uh, World PvP a little bit later in the segment, but ears are definitely making a comeback. But let's go back to the class, because there's just nothing more exciting to be able to introduce to a Diablo game than another class for players to check out. Yeah, this is uh, this is a pretty cool thing. We don't get to do this very often, right? I think it was uh, you that said that, John, uh, there's always room around the campfire. There's always so a little room. We, we, we had uh, kind of like a very core archetypes to begin with the brute strength of the, bar the barbarian, the arcane knowledge of the sorceress, kind of a return of a shape-shifting classic with the druid. No RPG lineup is complete without that dexterity class that's kind of like defeating enemies with finesse, with speed. And we kept coming back to just the, the idea of, of bringing it to the kind of the godfather of all dexterity-based archetypes, the, the rogue that we saw in Diablo 1. I mean, you got to be excited to have the rogue back. I mean, I know that like when we were exploring different classes, like you had talked about some of your experience with, with Diablo 1, right? Oh, for sure. So one of, the, one of the things that's super cool is like the, the, the rogue was always able to uh, adapt their play style. So fans of Diablo 1, Diablo 2 rogues will be able to create very archetypical rogues, starting with the weapon selection. On the melee weapon side, rogues can use swords and daggers as well as bows and crossbows on the ranged side. You know, just the, the, those sort of dagger attacks mixed with bow attacks, it's like, it just looks great on screen. With all the classes having this real strong identity as far as the animations and what they do, you think about the, the druid and shape-shifting or the barbarian with sort of, you know, his leap attacks. Um, there's just all these great things that you discover with the rogue that you can't really do with other classes. I love that you can start cosmetically from such a iconic place where you're wearing the red armor, you kind of look like part of the sisterhood of the, the Sightless Eye from the original games. You know, you can maybe even uh, add some tattoos into the mix, some scars, um, make that rogue your own. Or if your fantasy of the rogue is uh, a more uh, traditional RPG outlaw, you're definitely able to uh, create that and put on your kind of hood and half mask and uh, be more of a shadowy character yeah and the character customization you kind of mentioned it being able to craft that you know that the the class of your your dreams or your nightmares it was a feature that i was honestly super nervous about when we started because th we never had this in a diablo game but seeing where it is now it's one of those things that like i'm super excited about with, with, with where we're at there's just a lot of creativity and fun looks and you can be that that you know tattooed criminal out outlaw or you can be a more noble looking kind of you know sort of like thief with, uh, with uh, good morals. <laughs> well, one of the things that, that we kind of kept running with beyond just the cosmetics well, was customization. We had this uh, this niche to fill in the class lineup that, that spoke to the, the finesse player, to the dexterity player. Um, and just that everyone's idea of what that could be was a little bit different, whether um, it, it leaned more on range or melee. But uh, we, we, we took that a little bit of a step further. We really wanted to have each class in our game have, just have that one thing that makes you go like, that's bullshit when you see uh, a player use it and that makes you want to re-roll that class because no other class gets it. For the rogue, it's the class specialization. The three specializations are combo points, shadow realm, and exploit weakness. I, I like shadow realm because I, I, I take the problem and I make it smaller. I mean, it's just, I just pull three guys into the shadow realm and duke it out. And then I come back in, I'm like, all right, smaller problem. <laughs> I, I love the idea of exploit weakness. The way it works is uh, during some of the, the enemy attacks, players will see an icon flash over the enemy's head, during which time they will get to retaliate with much more damage than an ordinary attack. If you're quick on the draw, this is the specialization for you. I'm, I'm just like a little bit skill capped there. And you know, like every time I try to make it work, I'm just, just a little bit shy of the skill level uh, that's required for that. It's almost like you're a surgeon. Um, and it requires a, a really uh, a strong ability to assess what's happening all around you. My, my favorite, my personal favorite is the combo point specialization. 
As you might expect, this ability lets you build multiple combo points, which enhance your spender's effectiveness in combat. It, it, it basically, you just like get into this rhythm of combat of like three builders to a spender, it lets you build up to these big, big moments. It, 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 it almost makes like a rhythm game out of combat, which I really enjoy. And the way the class specializations work is uh, you will work with one of the world groups of rogues uh, around the world in Sanctuary that you will find and do class specific quests that no other class can do whether it's the Sisterhood of the Sightless Eye, the remnants of that order that you choose to work with, or the mercenaries of Kajistan, or the, you know, the outlaw smugglers of the swamps of Hawazar, depending maybe on what speaks to your uh, class fantasy, or depending on which specialization speaks to you or you find more powerful, you'll be able to complete that quest line and then activate that, that specialization, uh, which then you can mix and match with any of the playstyles. So you could be a combo points ranged or melee player, but you could also be an ex exploit weakness range or melee or hybrid player. It just gives the class such, such huge uh, variety in builds and play styles. I love how that ties into the open world aspect. Um, you know, the ability to go to Kejistan or Hawazar and get these special quests that only the rogue can get. And that touches on one of the things that I love that we've done, which is like connecting the weapons and equipment to regions. When you're when you're exploring the world and you pick up a sword in Kejistan, it's a, it's a scimitar, right? If you're up in Skosglen, which is up in the north, it's more of like a broadsword. Um, you know, it, it's this sort of like this, it's a subtle thing, but it, I think it really, you know, different armors that you get in different regions look like they're from the place. Um, and so giving that sense of place in the world is something that I, I just, I, I, every time I play the game, I feel it, I see it in just like subtle ways and just really enhances the overall sense of immersion and experience. And I just want to see what's around the corner. The, the weapons uh, are, are also like, going back all the way to Diablo 2, uh, just such an integral part of the class and the ability to augment your weapon through magic, through enhancements, uh, is it, just something that really spoke to us when we try to tap into the core of the class. Um, going back to the, those mer uh, mercenaries that you could hire, it was always kind of cool to see what kind of uh, special uh, arrow shot they would, uh, they would come with. Um, and it's something we paid homage to with the, the imbue system. Um, all the way from directly elemental imbues like uh, the frost imbue, which feels uh, a lot like the, 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 the ice arrows that the D2 mercenaries used to shoot, uh, all the way to, uh, we expanded it to feel a little grittier, a little darker into things like poison imbue and shadow imbue. Uh, just the ability to take uh, any, any sort of attack and kind of mix and match with those imbues. Once it, that kind of clicked for me that I could take any ability and imbue it with, uh, you know, either of those elements. Uh, Rain of Arrows with Frost and Rain of Arrows with Acid is completely different, right? Like you're essentially freezing the battlefield. Um, and then I just love Poison Imbue because of the, the gruesome deaths that, that all the monsters experience. Uh, and we've had a ton of fun making that art, so it's always fun to kind of see the, you know, just a field of goatmen melt into nothing. You know, you just kill everything on the screen in a in a in a gory mess, uh, which I, I never really gets old. It's a really flexible way to take a build that you're already comfortable with, that you already like. Say you like, you know, you're really comfortable with flurry and shadow step as kind of your melee skills, and you find yourself needing more uh, crowd control. Uh, without changing your playstyle, you can just add the frost imbue uh, to your bar, and now you're able to use those same abilities to slow down enemies or build up to a full freeze. Yeah, and frost imbue plays pretty well with uh, group play as well, right? You know, where I can freeze an enemy and somebody else can blow it up. <laughs> or also, uh, the, the way that like uh, chills work in the game, uh, they build up to a full freeze. So if you you know your your best buddy is a sorceress player. Uh, your chill spells and your frost imbue uh, chills will actually build up uh, faster than if you were uh, using a single player. So, you know, just uh, ask to open with Blizzard before you frost imbue and you'll, you'll basically be freezing enemies twice as fast, which is super awesome synergy. So uh, the last thing um, th that's worth uh, spending some time talking about the rogue is like how mobile the class is, just how able it, the, the class is to kind of close the gap between themselves and the enemy even while they're mounted, you might find yourself, you know, a full screen away and just dismounting into a rain of arrows, closing the rest of that gap with uh, maybe like a dash uh, and then getting back out of there, dropping some caltrops. They can basically control the, the, the fluid motion of combat in a way that no other class can. Uh, that's something that beyond all of the other customization options that you have, whether it's the play style, whether it's the range at which you engage with enemies, whether it's the cosmetics, 
just the sheer mobility of the class uh, lets you just adapt to the situations. Even even when you, you would have totally been toast as another class, a room full of elites, you're able to use offensive abilities in creative ways. Abilities like uh, sh uh, shadow stuff, right? Like abilities like shadow realm, abilities like dash. So you're able to kind of like use them to your advantage in a way that gets you out of a very dangerous situation by picking that one lone uh, skeleton archer that maybe is not surrounded by everything else. You can shadow step there, get out of the way and you know, live to fight another day, which just feels like such a rogue thing to do. When I play the rogue, I really do feel like like surgical precision. You know, I, I really feel like I can I can move through the whole screen uh, without, uh, uh, it feels kind of effortless um, and almost sometimes a little unfair. It's like when I go into Shadow Realm and I'm dashing, I'm like, am I cheating? Did I just break the game? And we'll hear more about PvP in a little bit, but I, I just couldn't go without mentioning that some of our most feared PvP players on the team play rogue and just the way they're able to like surprise you. You might be with a group of friends and just that mobility lets them go to the middle of the group, unleash a rain of arrows that's frost imbued. And before you know it, you're all frozen and looking at a rogue while you're frozen. Let me tell you, there, there are fewer sc scarier things in our game right now than that. So Luis, this was, uh, I mean, this is like the ultimate blog post. This has been a lot of fun getting to share a new addition to the campfire. Um, and of course, there's probably going to be more in the future, right? We always say there's a little bit more room around that campfire. That's right. And that pretty much wraps it up for the Rogue. So why don't we go to Joe and Karina and learn a little bit more about those open world features that we promised. Well, thank you to Luis and John for introducing the Rogue, which uh, I'm, I'm really excited that we finally got a chance to talk about and announce to the community. And we're here today to talk to you about Diablo 4 and the open world. Now, I think maybe the uh, the best way to start this conversation, uh, Karina, would be just to, for me to ask you, like, what are you what are you most excited about what we're adding in Diablo Four for the open world? Like, what what feature, what what mechanic, what 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 are you most excited to talk about first? I am really excited about uh, just exploring the world. I am a huge completist naturally; that's the way I play, and I love exploring and looking after every single nook and cranny. The more this game has been growing, particularly since last at BlizzCon. Um, the more fun I am having just riding around the open world on my mount and exploring everything I possibly can. Yeah, it's it's really fun, I think, uh, now that we've kind of taken Sanctuary and just made it so much larger when you're playing through the game. You know, when you compare it to like Diablo 3 or Diablo 2, there's tons of like exploration and, and, uh, and, and, um, and movement throughout the world in those games, obviously. But now that we've really been able to embrace the open world concept, we can really dive much deeper into like what, how does Sanctuary actually all fit together? Like be able to ride from uh, Skaz Glen to the Fractured Peaks. Like, be like it's very, very interesting that way. One of the things about that that I think is really neat is uh, the collection aspect of mounts. So, I mean, there's all these horses, horse breeds and other, uh, other mounts you can find throughout the world from completing puzzles or just finding hidden locations or slaying certain particular kinds of monsters, find various horses or things to customize your horse with, like uh, like horse armor. Uh, there are uh, hoof plates you can get and trophies to show off your accomplishments. There's lots of different ways to make sure that you can personalize your mount, make it really feel like it's your companion. Yeah, and it's really cool that, like like you mentioned with the horseshoes, you get to actually change the speed at which your horse can run. And it's something I like to be able to customize the horse to the type of gameplay that I like to enjoy as a player. And it's, it's really, really fun. I like the amount of variety that you give us. And I mean, there's there's more to mounts than just that as well. So like one thing we know we didn't want to do with mounts in Diablo 4 is we didn't want to have like jousting, this idea of like fighting from horseback. It's not really the Diablo experience, right? Yeah, that's something I'm super excited for. Um, like we shared at last BlizzCon, we had um, the sorceress, we showed her dismount skill ice dash where she shoots forwards off her mount and destroys everything in her path. Well, with the rogue, we got to have a little bit more fun with it. And the animation department has done a fantastic job of having her leap up into the air and uh, fire down like the rain of arrows that destroys everything. Um, it's really, really cool. It feels really good. You have to be like leaping from your saddle and just raining arrows down on your enemies as you pass by, getting down the fray and then starting to front, like stab people and poison people. Like that, that, is, that is spot on what we're looking for. Being able to jump in, engage with enemies uh, from your horse and then just fight it out, duke it out using your skills and everything else like we want. It's interesting that your mount can't get damage, but if a monster actually attacks you while you're mounted, you will actually be forced to dismount. So there is a, a flip side of actually 
judging for yourself when you do want to use that skill in order to prevent you from being forced off unintentionally. Yeah, there's definitely a little bit of gameplay there to make sure that you're using it in a way that is most appropriate to help you get where you're trying to go and also fight the monsters you want to fight. One of the things I'm most excited about for the, uh, for the open world right now is this feature we have called camps. So camps are basically these uh, strongholds of evil out in the overworld. And you got to remember that, you know, decades ago, uh, during the events of Reaper of Souls, you know, when Malthiel rose to power, the Reapers killed like nine out of ten people uh, throughout Sanctuary. Like a, a tremendous number of people passed away. Uh, now there's a big power vacuum out here, you know, you know, decades later. And these, these monsters have started to move into these places. Bandits, monsters, goat men, all kinds of different creatures, skeletons, the undead, have started to like resurface and come back into these areas and start to take them for themselves. You, as the hero of Sanctuary, get to kind of wander through these spaces and begin to reclaim them for the people of Sanctuary. That's part of what makes them really, really neat. Each of them have their own story. They're their own unique fixed place in the world. Unlike quests, quests are something that happens randomly in the world and you can come across them anyway. Camps are a permanent fixture that you as the player, when you come across that evil, you can actually have a real impact on the open world that everyone else can see because once you have defeated that evil, um, one of the really fun things is that you you basically unlock that camp and you, you make a new waypoint that previously didn't exist for yourself, but like suddenly all the marketplaces open up and now you have a blacksmith vendor in a location that previously didn't exist, which I think is really, really cool. Now, what we're looking at here, uh, this was a village, uh, the village of Karayusu, which now has fallen to ruins. You know, the, the people here in the Dry Steps had a problem. The problem was, uh, there were bloodthirsty cannibals that dwelled nearby and would regularly raid their community. And the people had to come up with a solution. They weren't strong enough to defend themselves from these cannibals. So they made a dark bargain with a demon. And they were able to gar gather enough power to push these cannibals out and protect their community. But not without great cost, as we can see here. You're kind of helping resettle parts of Sanctuary in many ways when you take these camps back from the enemy. Vendors will come back, and now suddenly there might be like new quest givers, new stories that need to be told. Dungeon entrances can appear uh, in some of these places afterwards. Like there's all kinds of things that occur after you take over the camp and liberate it from these forces of darkness. And again, it's just so, so cool to see you permanently change the world as you find these places and kind of wander through and solve these problems. One of the other neat things about camps and in general, like the overworld, just broadly speaking, is we have so many more opportunities now uh, to kind of play with movement. It pushes the, the bar vertically as well as horizontally. And we now have been playing around with the idea of jumping across chasms to allow the player to get access to a location that they previously didn't have. There's, uh, there's all kinds of areas for players to like find their own path, allowing them extra movement options they haven't had in previous Diablo games. We are also in a vertical top-down camera for the environment, and so it really breaks up the plane that you typically see as like not only as a developer, as an animator, but also as a player. There's such a huge variety of things that you can possibly do to mix it up and make things a little bit different. Uh, there's like certain puzzle elements to it. Um, that it's not so straightforward and not always obvious. So it's not just a matter of running through the world and getting you know, to your goal, it's you have to think about it. Yeah, definitely. Now, Karina, I know that you're very excited about PVP. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of PVP. I love the first time that we all actually had a chance to, as a whole team, play PVP, because the amount of feedback that that generated, I think it took design like three days to go through it all. And what that showed me is that I find everyone either, they either love it or they hate it. And I, I personally love it, I really enjoy it. So the way that PVP works is that the uh, hatred of Mephisto has been bubbling up from hell and has created these areas in the open world that you can freely walk into that kind of consumes you and makes you turn against your fellow players. PVP, even in these areas, these, um, these fields of hatred, right? Uh, even in these spaces, it's not like mandatory. So these are optional places players can choose to go uh, to kind of collect shards of hatred that they can uh, they can collect from like killing monsters, uh, from completing events, opening chests, all kinds of ways to earn these things, not necessarily just killing players. And as you earn these shards of hatred, they're kind of in an unpurified state. They're in a basic state. You need to bring them to a purification event in order to turn them into a currency that you can then use in the nearby like small encampments around the fields of hatred. And what's really neat about that 
is that when you're trying to purify these things, that's when everybody nearby finds out and hears like, oh, okay, well, someone's actually trying to complete a purification ritual. We need to go and kill those players and take all of their shards before they finish. But once you purify them, they're yours. You can't lose them. But, uh, but before they're purified, they're free game. Yeah, I think it's really important to note that like, even if you don't want to engage with other PvP players, you can actually explore those areas and collect the Shards of Hatreds from specifically monsters, but the second you need to then turn them in and purify them into a currency where you can spend them on gear, trophies, and other content, um, you actually are hostile yourself and actually can be attacked during that single moment. But I think that really um, creates a lot of opportunity for you to team up with friends for just that one little moment in order to gain the reward that you spent so much time collecting. So you called out earlier that uh, the Shards of Hatred are used for like some of the vendors you'd find in the Fields of Hatred. Uh, there are some special vendors that only kind of uh, arrive in these areas. They'll have you know, special costumes or new mounts. And, and weapons and things along those lines. Nothing that's like strictly more powerful than stuff you can get in other parts of the game, but stuff that really like speaks to your desire as a PvP player. And I think one of the things that's really kind of neat about the system in general is that as a player, if you choose to go hostile, betray your other, uh, betray the players that are near you, try to get as many shards of hatred as you can, you're going to slowly begin to kind of like infuse yourself with that same curse of Mephisto. And you're, you're going to become a vessel of hatred. Now, once you do that, Everyone within a very large radius of you is going to be able to see you as a threat on the map. And they're going to get a bonus for killing you. So if, when that occurs, you have a set amount of time you need to survive. And if you're able to do that without running away or jumping in a town portal and trying to escape, if you're able to do that and finish that period and manage to escape or, or, or defeat your you know, people who are coming to try to destroy you, uh, you're going to get a really big bonus at the end. And that's been really, really exciting to watch in our playtests already as people are like, kind of wrestling for this status and then trying to defend it once they actually achieve it. Yeah, and there's also the uh, ears that you get to collect as a trophy. Um, it harkens back to D2, where I think you could sell the ears for one gold. I don't know if we're going to be doing that. I know we were playing around with them as a currency at one point, but I think right now it's just a, a cool trophy that you get to collect and show off. Yeah, right now, very, very cool trophy. We, the thing was really neat about the Diablo 2 ears, like you could fill up your whole inventory with them, obviously, but being able to see like the uh, the people that you took the ears from, like seeing their their character names on there was always like the really the interesting, fun part. Kind of like proof like, yeah, I got, I got that person that time, right? So we want to make sure that we embrace that aspect of it. That's the important part for us. I think that's going to be a really, really great callback to Diablo 2 PvP. Right, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I love where PvP is going, and I love that it is such a, a, it's only one part of how large and open the world is, and really harkens back to the adventure in me when I play the game. How do you feel? I'm super excited as well. I mean, there's so much to look forward to in Diablo 4 right now. Like what we talked about today just scratches the surface. In general, as a Diablo fan, there's a lot to be looking forward to in the, on the franchise in the future. Uh, thank you so much for watching today. We look forward to speaking to you more about this game and others in the future.